And we are back on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. As always, I got my guys Dave Archer, DJ Shockley. I'm Derek Rackley. We're here for another episode. We're going to cover all things Falcons, of course. I'll give you a quick rundown of what we're going to cover today. We're going to get the guys quick reactions on what happened in the game last weekend. What went wrong in that matchup? Seemed like Mm. the Falcons were in control for, call it, three and a half quarters of that game. The positives that they can take away that can potentially help them rebound in a game against the Los Angeles Rams and then we'll get a quick little taste of the NFC South as we saw it last weekend. Couple teams winning, couple teams dropping games. So let's go back. We saw the first regular season game of the 2022 season at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. You both were there. All right, before we dive into the X's and O's and what happened in the game, Dave, just talk a little bit about the atmosphere because it sounds like from talking to you guys before we came on the air, it was an atmosphere that was kind of unlike any other the last couple of years anyway. Yeah, fellas, I thought that uh, certainly whenever you have your rival in the building, it's going to help with that right there was a lot of saint fans there as there usually is just like there's a lot of falcon fans that find their way into the superdome when we go to new orleans but uh so that added to it mm-hmm. uh, and there's no question but a lot of flag waving they passed out the american or they passed out the uh, atl flags and they were being waved uh atlanta got off to a good start to start the game that brought it yes. even more yes. to a fever pitch but i know shock i thought it was uh, as good a building as we've probably seen in a while to quote my man Two Chains, it was a vibe. <laughs> it was definitely a vibe in there. I mean, it, it felt like Atlanta. It felt like the spirit of what we saw years in the past and the excitement in the building. It felt like it was new. It felt like it was fresh. And the Falcons fans were going there. The Saints fans, of course, just back and forth like like Dave just mentioned. But you just love the feeling in there where everybody was into it. It looked like, you know, it was packed. It looked like, you know, you know a couple – Empty seats here and there, but not like it used to be. You know, it was packed. It was loud. It was energetic. The fans are into it. And that's kind of the thing that I think the, the guys fed on, man. It, yeah. was, it was great to see it. I was glad to see the, the fans show up and glad to see it wasn't, you know, all Saints fans in there. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I love, like, like, like Dave mentioned, they had the flags. And I even saw they had, like, you know, New Orleans has the umbrellas. And they say who that on the umbrellas. They said we that. So yeah. Uh, yeah. just a little small stuff like that that we're trying to create that home field was cool. May not be one of the biggest things across the league or from a, from a nationwide perspective, but to me it's like – when, at, when Atlanta and New Orleans play close games, it's good for the NFL. It's good mm-hmm. for the state of the division mm-hmm. just because the rivalry has been so good. And as you guys mentioned, it gets both fan bases up and excited. Uh, and that's what, yeah. at the end of the day, the players are wanting to see. Yeah, my partner on radio, Wes Durham, who does such a great job of calling the games for us, um, mentioned it. I thought it was a good way to put it, is there's, an, there's a college vibe to this rivalry. Yeah, you don't yeah. get that with Giants and Eagles or yeah. Giants Cowboys or even Bears Packers. Yeah. Here is kind of a because college football is king here in the South, and and but you felt that kind of that college feel, that pomp and circumstance, the yeah. little the color, the pageantry, if you yep, will. For yep. it, but you could feel that, Dave. I'm going to come back to you and and have you give me a quick newspaper headline, and and we might have a couple people because you know. You might have younger generation watching our podcast, right? Because podcasts are a thing for the younger generation. They might be like, yo, what's a newspaper? And what's a headline? <laughs> okay, so it was like these paperish type things that you used to read to get scores and a rundown of the game. That's yeah. actually what we're talking about, just in case you're curious. Okay, so give me a headline, newspaper headline of what it would have been, let's call it Monday morning after the game, after Atlanta ended up coming up short. I think it would be damn with a couple of exclamation points behind it. <laughs> oh, the little things. Oh. Uh, damn, the little things. Uh, right? Dave, if you would have said Gina afterwards, uh, yeah, that, was, <laughs> that would have been a vibe. Yeah, I right? could go there. I could go there. Right? Okay, I could go there. All right. So. <laughs> That's, a good, off, call. That's a good call. Went off the rails for yeah, a minute there. Right. All right, DJ, give uh, me your uh, newspaper headline. Man, I feel bad about mine. Mine's not as good now. <laughs> Thinking about uh, artists and you coming up with one, that's a one right there. Uh, mine would just be three and out. I mean, you think about, like you mentioned before we came on, three pretty good quarters. Yeah. Not so good in that last quarter. So you were out. So I, I think it was one of those type of things where you showed up for three and, you know, you were there in the end, but not really. Yeah, I'll just be real quick with mine, and I'm going to say failure to close. And it's yeah. just it's one of those things where you, know, you always hear that phrase, guys. Football's a 60-minute game. And even after three quarters, it's, you're through 45 minutes. you still got 15 left, right? And even some – ask the Colts and the Texans. They mm. still had extra time in their overtime game. Mm. 
you got to finish in the NFL. Yeah. And, and, and we're going to get into the, some of the specifics of the game here, but like Michael Thomas was pretty quiet throughout the course of the game. And then what happens in the fourth quarter? Dude, Damn, like, dude, yep. just, <laughs> dude just comes back <laughs> and, and goes on a tear. So let's talk about what went wrong in this one, Dave. I'm going to come right back to you. Atlanta seemed like, I don't want to say dominating, right? To me, that's a little bit strong, but in firm control of the game, call it through three, three and a half quarters, right? And then things started to get weird in the fourth quarter. What went wrong for Atlanta? Yeah, I think the control of the line of scrimmage was something we had talked about last week that was going to be important. This was going to be a game where Atlanta needed to, d to stop the run game and, and be able to get their own run game going through Marcus Mariota and, and the running backs, and then off of that, all the things that can develop. That happened. You were, you were playing on their side of the line of scrimmage, both offensively and defensively against this team. And I mentioned the little things. And, and little things more often than not, and we all are grilled and, and pounded in our head about fundamentals, mm. you know, catching the football, taking care of the football, yep. um, you know, little things like taking a snap. I mean, shock will tell you in short yarded situations when they tighten down, you got to, that's a hard block for the center. Yeah. Oh, no. And so the center's got to get his pad level. What they're trying to do is trying to get a stalemate. They're trying to get underneath the center right mm -hmm. there to stop the play so there's no movement. So as a quarterback, I got to really make be diligent about riding riding the center there. Ball comes out. I talked to Marcus after the game. He said, "Hey, I was trying to cheat the snap because we got the look they wanted. We yeah. wanted. Yeah. He's gonna, he was going to snatch it and step around that. You know, they'd gone to a solid look over mm -hmm. the guard center guard. I was just going to step around that and pick the first down up. Um, so he was he was trying to compete. He was yeah. trying to make a play, yeah. and just his he lost his fundamentals there a little bit. There were there were some things like that to me. That's what crept in the into the fourth quarter." And somehow, some way, Jameis got in a rhythm. And I, yeah. I likened it on the radio. Trey Young was in the building, rang the train whistle for us. Yeah. It's like a three point shooter. Yeah. You know, you miss 10 in a row in the first three quarters of the game. Oh, and all of a sudden, one. boom, you get one to go. Yeah. And then, boom, you're feeling it. And he looked like he got a couple to go. And he changed into a different dude. And what do they say, Dave? Shooters shoot, right? Yeah. Like you, you can't yeah. go 0 for 10 if you're a shooter and stop shooting. And at That's some right. point, you keep it, go, it goes in. You're right, Jameis Winston. Let's let's DJ. I'm going to come to you. But remember, started the fourth quarter, 23-10 lead. Right? Atlanta's got the ball. They go down second and goal. There's a false start. Right? Little things. Exactly. Little you just things. can't have them when you yeah. get in the red zone, right? Yeah. And then on the third down play, they take a shot to Edwards. He looks like there's a window. The ball's dropped. What ends up happening? Field goal instead of touchdown, right? And in some, sometimes you have to feel the urgency of a game, and it's like you got to score touchdowns and not field goals. So even though Atlanta goes up at that point, 26 to 10, as Dave mentioned, here comes Jameis. Comes right back, goes four for four on the next drive, and he wakes up some guy named Michael Thomas. Yeah. And then they would say the rest is history. What ended up happening in your opinion? You know what, I, I think you guys have, have hit it spot on. I mean, it's not much more I can add to it because – the one thing that came to my mind was the thing that Arthur Smith went back to, and he talked about it in the preseason, about the details of the things that they can control, mm -hmm. like the pre-snap penalties, those things that got you behind, those things that kept the drive from going further or, or kind of stymied your, 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 your pressure as you started to, to, to get things going. I thought it was really critical in those situations that you had some of those key moments happen where the pre-snap penalties or you had a guy drop a ball here and there and then – you allow them – you kick a field goal where you were moving, driving, and you weren't able to push, punch the football in. I think that gave them confidence. I think that gave them a little bit of a – we're still in this ball game because at that point we kicked the field goal, and I'm sitting up in the press box, and I said, man, it's still only a two-possession game. Mm -hmm. It feels like it should be more, but it's still only a two-possession game. And like you mentioned, they go down, they get the two-point and all that kind of stuff, and they start to, to kind of feel good about themselves. So I think – the things you did to yourself really uh, is what hurt you. Well, and you can wind it back prior to that, too. And, and you were all told and talked about, and we can believe it because we played the game, that we can we can pick out two or three plays and say, wow, if we'd done that different. Yep. Well, if you rewind it, OZ gets a dime put on him on a deep end cut around midfield, Fumbles. and you're yep. gonna, he gets a ball knocked out. Yep. Give, gives New Orleans credit for raking the ball out. That's what they do. Got it out. Gave them a short field opportunity there. Defense came in and did a good job on that one. Marcus gets out of the pocket, does a great job avoiding rush, gets out of the pocket, not sure where he is on the field, didn't think he had the first down yet, although he had had it. Probably slides if he knew he were in that position, mm -hmm. gets inside the five, ball gets punched out again. Yep. So 
those are things that, again, little things that can happen that you got to make sure you take care of things. Yeah, and guys, you know, I, I can't help. I don't want to get off track too much, but I yeah. can't help but think about the game last night, right? You know, R Russell Wilson in Denver two times, two times inside the five-yard line. They fumble, fumble the, the football yeah. when they're when they're knocking on the door scoring seven points. And what ends up happening? Seattle pulls out the victory, right? So they're just certain times. You mentioned great job raking the football out. Yeah. How many times in your guys' career have you ever heard a coach say after a turnover, it's okay, right? Yeah, no. it never. No, it's like, never okay. To a Don't fan, yeah. you might say, gosh, that defensive player made a great strip. Like, he raked the football out. Yeah. Never in my life has a coach said, yeah, he did a good job. Yeah. Yeah, when right. you turned it, when you fumbled yeah. it, that was – Never. So to your point, there's never an excuse to turn the football over. How, No matter how good the defensive play was, you've got to secure the football. That's what your job is. Well, and, and real quickly to kind of back up what you're talking about with the Denver game, this is a big picture scenario here. Nine of the 16 games this weekend were decided by six points or less. Mm -hmm. Nine of the 16, six points or less. And there were a number of them that were two, three, one. Well, ours was a one-point game. We had yeah. two or three or three points. What what that means is is the things you're talking about the, the little the, you yes, get a ball more. knocked at take yeah. points off the board yep. for Denver for us yep. all of a sudden you look up and you don't have enough points to win the football game exactly think about all the times teams had to settle for a field goal instead of a touchdown and they came up short in these games that you're talking about yeah think if you gotten stoned on that drive where Marcus got down to about the ten or, or so large and still had to kick a field goal well that's the margin of victory no you doubt. know and so. It's not just him, it's it's the entire team understanding a sense of urgency, as you pointed out. Yep. The fourth quarter has to look like or better than the first three quarters did, yep. and we have we didn't get that done yesterday. And add one more thing to it. As players, we were always taught you never know which play is going to be in a mm -hmm. game mm -hmm. that matters. Yep. And that's why, you know, we're not harping on there's, you know, plays here in the fourth quarter that mattered. That wasn't what lost you the game. There's so many plays throughout mm -hmm. a ball game yep. exactly. that you can say, okay, like you mentioned, if we do that right or we don't do this or, you know, we do some, you never know what play in the game really matters the most or really can have a big influence on the game, ultimately, and you winning the game. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. So, fellas, we kind of went right to what went wrong, which made us kind of fast forward to the fourth quarter. Well, and we didn't even okay. really talk about the defensive side of the exactly. ball. Exactly. Because so, it's not like the defense didn't get, right. get the job Right. So, so let's kind of, like, switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about the first three quarters of the game where there was a lot of positives and how Atlanta can take some of those positives to next week. Because we yeah. don't we can sit here and dissect last week as much as we want, DJ. Right. Yeah. But let's talk a little bit about some of the positives. Cordero Patterson, Marcus Mariota, the things that he was able to do, getting the ball out on the perimeter, mm -hmm. and how that can help Atlanta to turn this loss from the Saints into a potential victory against the Rams next weekend. I think you ultimately saw a new style of offense that – that I think Falcons fans should be excited about. I mean, you saw this offense go up and down the field versus a defense last year that was one of the top defenses in the league. Running the football, you saw Mariota on the edge. You saw eight different guys caught a pass. I mean, there were so many things that you can like about this game, but also the number one thing was you protected the quarterback and you ran the football. Mm -hmm. And those are remedies that can go on any road. They can play against anybody yep. and win ball games for you yep. if you can do that. 200 yards rushing. I mean, CP, you know, almost had 100 yards in the first half. I mean, those are things that you look at and say, okay, look at the big guys up front. Everybody's talked about the offensive line. We talked about the offensive line a lot. How can these guys – be the guys that help you win ball games and help your offense be successful. And I thought that was really crucial. I thought OZ had a good game other than all the fumble. He was there. He was, you know, you know, there for uh, Marcus Mariota throughout the ball game. Uh, obviously, Drake London in his first appearance uh, since we've seen him in one good. play in the preseason. I thought he showed up big in his mm -hmm. ball game, showed what he's exactly about. It was fun to see this offense. And the one thing that I love the most – as a quarterback watching it, was how multiple this offense was. Uh -huh. How many different formations. I mean, there was so much movement at the line of scrimmage. There was so much going on that the Saints defenders had to worry about 
pre-snap before the ball was even snapped that gives you something to be excited about because when other teams turn on the table, they're going to say, wow, we got a lot to prepare for. Yeah. Not only what's going on pre-snap, but then when they step the football, where's this quarterback going to be? You never know. So I, I enjoy watching this offense you know, be as efficient and productive as it was at times. You know, Dave, one of the things that we talked about and, and Atlanta made an, an effort in the preseason, in the offseason, was getting more pass rush. And I don't want to kind of pigeonhole you here, but there was some really good things on the defensive side of the ball from Jared, Grady Jarrett that we've talked about so often, how he is just steady Eddie. He gets in the backfield a couple times. Arnold Ebicady, Michael Walker. What did you see from the defensive side or what else? Maybe it's something that you want to build off offensively. Do you feel like they can build on for next week? That's it's going to be a positive thing for them to get a victory against the Rams. Well, I'll just use one word and back up what Shock's talking about offensively real quickly. And the word comes to mind for me is sustainable. Mm -hmm. This is not something that was a one weekend scenario. Mm -hmm. Right. They have the ability to make this work throughout because there's too much multiplicity to it. There's the formations, the players, the quarterback adds to that. I mean, Marcus's ability to stretch you sideline to sideline is a problem, yeah. and we saw it come to bear. Cam Cam Jordan is one of the best defensive players in the league. Yep, I called his name once yes. on Sunday. Neutralized. He didn't do anything. Yes. I mean, he, and you could see him take a step and stop. This is a guy that in 22 career games against the Falcons had 23 sacks. Yes. And he was just standing there watching. What do I do? What do I do? That's what's presented there. Defensively, Dean Pease's multiplicity came to life in the game. I think what it did was is it gave you a glimpse of what can happen if Grady Jarrett is singled. Yep. He got he gets singled. You're not blocking him. He even fought through a double team to get one of half, yeah. half of oh, half the sack. Yeah. It was phenomenal. But. So that creates, okay, so now I've got players potentially up front. Ebi KT coming off the edge, one clean. That was him one-on-one -on -one with a tackle mm -hmm. off the edge, gets home, gets the sack. You'll love to see that. Um, I do think that there's some multiplicity in their ability to bring, the, bring blitzes. We saw Jalen Hawkins get home. We saw Michael Walker get home. There was a number of guys that came clean. I think even Richie Grant came, got, got clean on a play. With some of the looks that you're going to see, you talk about studying the tape and having to get ready Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to play this team. There's so many different looks that Dean Pease can give at you. Now, there's also some teaching moments here. Mm -hmm. And I think you have one of the best young corners in the National Football League in A.J. Terrell. I would imagine this is a really good teaching film for him. Yes. I thought his coverage was about as good as you could do against one of the best receivers in the league. Sometimes the other guy just a little bit better than you are. <laughs> no doubt. And that's what happened in this game. And, yeah. and you said Michael Michael Thomas came awake or yeah. woke up. Yeah. He, no question about it. <laughs> I mean, because those were not easy plays. So AJ's a gunslinger. He'll forget about it, move on the next week, and he'll be better for it. But uh, I thought there was a lot of really cool teaching moments in this thing as, as much as it smarts. One thing I wanted to come back to you about, Dave, and, and tell me your opinion, whether it had anything to do with it. Do you feel like the defense struggled with some of the tempo, or do you think it was just more of in, back in the fourth quarter I'm talking about, or was it more of just Jameis got hot and he found Thomas and Landry? No, I think it was a combination okay. of it. I think that there was some technique errors. You know, when, when you got – when you get the throw to Landry down the sideline, okay, just from a technique standpoint in that part of the game, that Landry catches the deep shot that's going to put him in field goal yep. range. That's a scenario where defensively, I've got to lose ground as a corner. I got to take that throw away. I can give away the throw in the flat. I can we can rally up and make that tackle. I can't let the ball right. go over my head. Right. Uh, and subsequently, the corner's got to understand, or the safety's got to understand that too. I got to get over. I got to get that ball knocked down. The ball was in the air a long time on that mm -hmm. play. So again, I talked talking about teaching moments and things that hurt to have to teach it that way. But I thought those are some of the things that kind of came to bear in the game. Another moment, Landry catches a seam ball down the middle of the field. Nobody touches him. Nobody reroutes him. Those are some of the small details. You win a guy like that who's running down the seam. You got to find a way to get your hands on him, reroute just a little bit because it was all time. As soon as James hit his back foot, he was hitting him coming across the middle. Those are some of the small things that Dave talks about. I do think the tempo, you bring up a good point, mm -hmm. Rack. I do think the tempo bothered him. And it came at the right time because I think the defense had balled out for the better part of three quarters and a couple of minutes. Um, I almost wonder, did you get a little bit tired in game yeah. one? There was yeah. a lot of emotion. There was a lot of adrenaline flowing. Yeah. You were balling out, getting after them, taking the ball away, hitting people, playing physical. Did that a little bit take a toll on you? in the right. four, and, and again, another one of those deals where – 
I've got to understand that I've got to play 60 minutes, as you talked about off the top. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about some of the good performances. The special teams guy in me wants to make sure I mention Young Way Koo. I mean, a couple of 50-plus yarders in the Man. first half, and, I mean, Man. it was like – it was no-brainer. Yeah. Like, no it doubt. was splitting the uprights. Yeah. I mean, Not even close. You yeah. know, those are little things I think a lot of fans take for granted, but at some point those are going to end up winning games for us. When you have the faith in a guy that can just drill a 50-plus yarder, <laughs> doesn't have to keep it low and potentially get blocked. He's got the leg to get it up. Up in the air uh you talked about drake london a lot of really good performances cp i thought play was burst mm. not to say that he didn't last year but he looked fresh he looked fast he great, looked physical great point and, and let's give arthur smith some credit there grady jarrett to sack and a half i thought he had both sacks but sack and a half was extremely active cp ran like uh, you know a young a yeah. spring spring mm -hmm. spring chicken those guys were not overused in, in training camp. Remember, yeah. he rested those guys. He got yep. just enough snaps out of them in a couple of games. They didn't do a lot. They practiced. I thought you know, if somebody deserves some credit, think about Arthur Smith there and his management of some of the older players – and it paid dividends in the game. Absolutely. those They don't need to see what those guys can do yeah. in the preseason. They're you know, regular season gamers. We need them for 17-plus yeah. in the regular <laughs> season. All right, guys, real quick before we head out, um, DJ, I'm going to come to you first. Let's just talk about the NFC South. I'm going to give you Panthers and Browns. Baker Mayfield goes back to Cleveland. He plays them hard, but they come up short 26-24. Anything stick out to you in that game? Uh, I thought the Browns got after Baker in that game. I think he had four. He got sacked four times in that ball game. And the Browns ran. Nick Chubb had 144 yard, 141 yards in that game. Robbie Anderson had a good game. He was 5 for 102. But I thought they got after uh, that offensive line and uh, of the of the Carolina Panthers with four sacks. That's never good. It's, as we know, you know the quarterback is different. <laughs> and uh, the Browns did that. We, I mean, we know the Browns front is is pretty pretty doggone good. Uh, but I think ultimately that was a big part of the ball game. And then we got Sunday Night Football, Dave. I, I read this the article uh, real quick about like Tom Brady is his absence away from um, the Buccaneers during training camp, and it basically I, I read that like he had made a promise to his wife that he would take her on a vacation, and like he goes to Bahamas <laughs> for like. 11, 12 days during the preseason. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm reading this, and I look at my wife, and I'm like, who, who, who gets to go to Bahamas during preseason? Right. Like, how many guys get to do that? It's no big deal. Come back, you start week one, and you go ball out, right? Mm -hmm. Tom Brady gets things afforded to him that basically no other NFL no, player no. does. I don't know. If I'm Vita Bay and I look at my <laughs> phone, I see Tom drinking a rum drink down in the house. And I'm in training. And I got all What's my going pants on? on? <laughs> Like, what's going on? This is backwards, fellas. <laughs> you feel away, but you don't feel away. But, that is, but Dave, it works out. The Buccaneers yeah. go and they beat Dallas. Obviously, Dak Prescott gets banged up in that game, but Tampa Bay comes away with a 19-3 win. Yeah, I, I, th I still think that there was some effect to it. I, they were they did not look well-oiled. Give Dallas some credit defensively. Micah Parsons was a monster. They didn't get him blocked. Oh, by the way, there's going to be a lot of teams that aren't going to get that guy blocked, but I thought they struggled. Their offensive line's in trouble. Donovan Smith, I think, got hurt in the game. Is that? Was, I think that's the. Uh, I think so. He, he got uh, one, the left tackle, I believe. Mm -hmm. They already have lost two guys in the interior. Yeah. Um, they did have some problems with some pressure. Um, you, Godwin's got a hamstring now. We know that he's probably going to be out for a little while. There was a familiar face that yep, made some plays. There was. Um, so. Uh, by the way, he caught – I'm tired of hearing this. I keep hearing it on local radio. Julio Jones caught some vertical passes in his career here in Atlanta, by the way. <laughs> okay, just want you to know that. Just because he's down at Tom Brady and caught a 45-yard for Tom Brady over the shoulder, that's great. He caught a whole bunch of those here in Atlanta. <laughs> I don't want to start hearing about all, oh, he's with the GOAT now, so now he's going to shine out. The dude had like 10,000 yards here. Y'all <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah, Krug arch up now. He's right. That's oh. ridiculous. I think he had 300 yards receiving in one game. That was Matt Ryan <laughs> that was throwing the ball. DJ, did you see, too, it was kind of like a cockeyed yeah, look. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, I'm not really making yeah. eye contact yeah. to you, but y'all need to He's stop. Like, really let me see somebody let right me get back I'm on task here. Let me I'm get back on task. <laughs> You're talking Tampa, right? Yeah. Okay. No, I think I, I think Tampa. The one thing I will say about the about the con or the division, yep, is there was some questions as to how good Atlanta was going to be, and maybe even how good Carolina is going to be. Right. And then there was kind of this overwhelming. Okay, it's Tampa, and it's the Saints, and maybe it's the other way around. Saints yep. and Tampa. It's a lot closer than that. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. The, the Carolina and Atlanta are going to have a say in what happens. I'm not saying that both win the division or they're yep. going to be playoff. But they're going to have a say as to what happens because they're better teams than people are giving credit for, especially here in Atlanta. Yep. And we're going to we're going to see it this weekend. They're going to go ball out as best they can out in L.A. Yeah, it was it was cool to see a couple familiar faces of Julio Jones, Russell Gage, both over there with Tampa. Uh, so we'll see how that thing ends up working itself out moving forward. You mentioned Godwin. Of course, they need him back on the field. He's obviously a dynamic player. Neil over there running around, so I'm running out. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for this week. Of course, we talked about it. L.A. Rams, uh, Falcons are going to be doing a West Coast trip followed up by Seattle. Um, so we'll see how Atlanta can handle the going across the country, dealing with the time change and all the stuff that goes along with that. Art should be good by then, right? He'll be good you know going to West Coast. Here's another thing. Yeah, he got, might be pulled off oh. by the time he goes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. go. I keep hearing about how, oh, the Rams lost. The, they're going to be upset. Who cares? Yeah. With, we <laughs> no lost. Doubt. We're upset. No what doubt. about our mindset? I don't no care doubt. about their mindset. Yeah. Basically, I mean, I'm tired of hearing about, oh, they're the champs and they're going to be upset. We we drew it the wrong time. I don't care about that. Yeah. Maybe you need to start listening to a different radio station. I'm gonna yeah, send you. I'm gonna send you a playlist of like smooth R and B to like to cool you down a little Mrs. bit. Mrs. Blank told me before the games he drinks a uh, drinks a a blueberry Red Bull. I had one before the game show today. I'm fired up. I'm ready to say it. Dave's jumping out of his stool over there. Maybe we got to get blueberry Red Bull for every show that uh, Arch is on. Hey, thanks so much for joining us again uh, on whichever way you get your uh, podcast material: Spotify, mm. iTunes, Atlanta Falcons or YouTube. Make sure you like, subscribe, and review us. And of course, join us next week. Not sure if Arch is going to make it because he's going to be out on the West Coast, but maybe I'll get one of his um, uh, energy drinks. Yeah, and yeah, I'll yeah. be over here bouncing NBG's around done. with DJ. There we go. We'll do this thing. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be, back. we'll be back for another episode of the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T next week. Thank you.